Okay, welcome folks. Today we're looking at the business needs for IT services. So we're going back to yesterday, last week, the whole of the purpose of enterprise architectures and we're going to be looking really at what's going on at that very, very top level of the Zachman enterprise architecture uh, sort of matrix. What is it that drives the need for IT in business particularly? Because IT is just another tool for doing things. And so why do we need it? And then how do we actually use IT to support those needs that the businesses actually want to sort of achieve? I think you probably know that I've got three sort of conferences in three weeks. I was down in London last, uh, on Wednesday this week. And we were looking at the role of data, big data, in the telecoms industry. And I was there trying to help them with some of the understanding of the governance requirements, which we'll be looking at in next year's module, Sustainable Information Corporate Governance. But we'll introduce it very briefly. And the point about IT today, it's a tool to help organizations get value for themselves, get value for their customers. The word v value starts with a V and it is one of 14 words starting with V which are helpful <coughs> for businesses to understand in the context of corporate and information governance how they can look at their systems, at their big data, at the analytics processes that they operate to try to ensure that they're not doing things that are wasting money, wasting people's time, wasting people's resources, whether it's inside their organization or other stakeholders outside of the organization, like their customers, their suppliers, um, their shareholders even. So at the back of your mind, keep this idea of V for value as a guideline thinking about every aspect of the use of information, information technology, the hardware, the software, and all those, those other things, plus the paper systems, the people systems, and the people, that's the totality of an information technology system, make sure that you're doing everything that adds value. But if you go, remember three or four weeks ago when I introduced you to the topic, <coughs> I pointed out that depending on how you built your business model, the failures, the cost of the failures for IT are some of the most incredible value destruction. The fact that we don't build systems which work, we don't build systems which are secure. Think about what we heard this morning. How many of you heard this morning about <coughs> uh, talk talk? So a few of you are aware of what the current critical issues are for every single one of the four million customers of TalkTalk. Talk. Cyber attack. Pardon? Cyber attack. Cyber attack. A, mon a massive cyber attack over a sustained period of time, which is very, very, very similar in what we now at the moment know with a huge cyber attack on the target organization two years ago. Which is kind of like the thing a lot about the hell with the PSN network, where they've lost a lot of credit details. All sorts of things like that. Yeah. Everybody's doing because they've still not got round to implementing encryption on the databases and encrypting the data within the databases that hold customer details and particularly login credentials and user IDs, credit card details, and so on and so forth. 4 million customers who do not know whether or not they've had their details extracted and will be going to be used over the next few months. Which is why TalkTalk, Talk, to their credit, has said immediately, we are providing 12 months um, protection, personal ID protection, for every single one of their customers. But this is just like what happened at Target in, in some respects. A sustained attack over a period of time target, it was about 14 days before people actually did something and stopped and closed down the attack. It's going to be interesting to find out how long this attack on TalkTalk Talk was, um, 
going on for until they close it down. So value destruction. Yep. Was it the same with Sony Network? I don't know the fine details about how long the attack on Sony lasted for. It obviously took a little while, and that raises interesting questions about how their uh, detection systems took so long to actually identify there's something going wrong here. Part of the problem is IDSs, the intrusion detection systems, have all sorts of alerts. <coughs> They're monitoring fantastic volumes of data, <clears throat> and it gets very, very difficult, even with the best analytics in the, uh, to, you can think of, to really detect some of these incidents quickly. You'll see white papers coming out of all sorts of suppliers that says, we've well, got new ways of detecting, we'll find it quicker than anybody else. We'll see. And then the other side of the coin is to change your system, which is not designed for security, to a security design with encryption of all of this important data, is actually a, a non-trivial job. It's a very, very big job, in fact, and that's part of the reason that I suspect why so many organizations have yet to encrypt our data. But anyway, we're trying to look at why do businesses need it to achieve that tier one or level one in the Zachman architecture? How can that help us to identify the right sort of IT? And then on the other side, from thinking from the IT side, what can we do to help organizations or our organization do things better and well. If we go back over the last 10, 15, 20 years of the IT, the way that companies use IT, um, there are some important and interesting questions that we need to think about. We all know that businesses have strategies that try to guide them in the right direction. Some of the uh, business modules you've done over the last year or two, year and a half, have tried to help you to understand a little bit about the way that businesses decide where they're going. And the fundamental, one of the fundamental questions is, that's asked of many, many chief information officers is, how are you going to help us, the businesses, who are doing the productive things, how are you gonna help us to actually be productive and do really efficiently and effectively. Part of that is to think about the word V for value. So the question is, what do we mean by the value of IT? And can we even measure it? So there's been a lot of research over time about this. <clears throat> and then Okay, so if we know what the word value means, what they are a sort of shared meaning of the word, the defined meaning of the word value, we can then ask the next question is, how does IT, all of this technology, databases, hardware, networks, private clouds, public clouds, hybrid clouds, all of these sort of things, how does that provide value to an organization? And to do that, we need to think about the question, what can IT do well, and what can't it do well? And we talked last week a little bit about one of the projects you're looking at, which is in your is it team project, or group project yeah, module. Hour. Pardon? Just hour. You just had an hour with um, Clive as well. You've got to think about what the important questions are. Not, oh yes, it's a database, we can build a database. Yeah, so what? Anybody can build a database, but can you do it that actually is useful? Or is it something that's not going to be helpful at all? And so there's lots and lots of questions around the, what can't do well. And one of the problems we see in many, many com conferences that I've been to, the business conferences, they always talk about the fabulous things. And you can't really blame chief inf uh, the chief executives and so on. And, all the business executives who don't understand IT, you can't really forgive, uh, you can easily forgive them for thinking that actually IT is the magic silver bullet, solves all problems, but it can't. And we need to help the businesses understand the things that IT can't do well, or can't do at all. There are lots and lots and lots of questions. Now, 
guy called Claudio Shibora and an another colleague of his, Ole Hanseth. Shibora was Italian, but he worked at London School of Economics on occasion. And Ole Hanseth comes from Scandinavia. And they've been, they worked for a long time during the 80s and the 90s on something called actor network theory. And Claudio Shibora then took it a little bit further to look at how do we actually align information technology strategies with business strategies. And he provided this rather beautiful picture here, which shows us the classic way that we generate business strategies by looking at market forces, five, Porter's five forces that you looked, after, looked at a couple of weeks ago, uh, value chain model that we looked at, briefly mentioned yet last week, things like globalization, we need to be connected, we need to do things quickly, uh, and so on and so forth, with less people, less resources, all of those sort of things. Standardization, implementing big ERP systems like SAP or Oracle, and all of those other ones from all the suppliers, that standardize the basics of the business process. And they lead into this thing called the business strategy, the direction we want to go with our company for the next 10, 15, 20 years. <coughs> And that can be at the global corporate level or at the different business unit levels. Marketing, manufacturing, production, sales, and so on. But then we have lots and lots of stuff coming in from technology. New ways of doing things. In the 1990s, business process re-engineering, ERP systems, groupware, and so on. And we now have all sorts of other systems, the social network systems that feed us. Uh, big data analytics systems that help us to get understanding of what's going on in our data. People like IBM and SAS, particularly active in the field, uh, and Microsoft with Microsoft Dynamics. Um, and then the theory, so we've got lots of good ideas coming in, this is how we can begin to help the business. And then at the top level of the organisation, the two lots come together. And the business, the chief executive and the executive team he has try to pull those together to come up with, okay, we can use these bits of technology to help these bits of direction for our business units. <coughs> and we have this thing called the top-down strategic alignment. So to make sure that we're implementing the right bits of technology to help the business across the, across the whole operation. Now this actually tends to lead to more and more complex IT. It has done for the last 40, 50 years. We get more and more processes that tend to, be at a bit, tend to get a bit complicated and complex, and we try to apply standards as well. Do it this way. And so down to here, a top-down strate strategic development process that theoretically leads to the right business plans being supported with the right sort of technology. And then we come to, let's put it into practice. Now we have to roll all of these ideas out, month by month, year by year, so that the business becomes more effective. And then we start, according to uh, Claudia Shibora, then we run into some interesting and difficult problems. We have resistance by parts of the organization that feel that they're not being served appropriately. They were able to do things in the old days, and now the new strategy says you can't do that. <coughs> One of the classics over the last 10, well, round about late 90s through to early mid or mid 2000s was those small parts of the organization, particularly in marketing, advertising, sales, who said, we want to produce the best and most engaging material for our customers, and that requires us to do, use Apple Map technology. <coughs> well, back in those days, they had, I mean, Macs used very spe specific chipsets and very specific software, and you couldn't, as you, whereas you can now, but back then you could not run Windows on a Mac. And so, so they were saying, well, uh, you know, but you can't, you can't connect to us. We don't have the right networks to connect Max to the, main, the rest of the Wintel environment. And they got really, really upset because they were being constrained in how they could do things. 
they weren't going to be able to do what they needed to do to meet their corporate objectives. So, big upset, and then you had to destroy, uh, implementation tactics had to be implemented to try to actually meet some of their needs. That leads to complexity, leads to compromises. The other thing is we're not good at developing IT effectively. We haven't been for years. We still see it all the time. We see it as a result uh, reflected in the chaos reports year by year that we just don't implement IT successfully. 35% successful on average and all the rest challenge or fail. But also we get all sorts of surprises, unintended consequences, Gosh, I never thought of that. Both in terms of the technology capability and the organizational impact. This was intended to lead to a 20% productivity improvement, for example, and the unexpected outcome could be up. It's a 25% increase in resource requirements. Unintended consequences, which lead to that extreme perspective of the costs of failure of IT of being six trillion dollars a year. So you end up with all sorts of compromises in the ins actual installed base. Yeah, you have a strategy that says you, and if you go back to the 1990s, you had hubs as a communication devices, and then we needed to move to switches, which is modern standards. But for, in some organizations, they couldn't afford to replace every single little hub with proper switches. And so you had a, a mixed environment which doesn't perform very well. You end up then with sort of a bottom-up activity to make things kind of just work rather than work smoothly. And the result of that is you start drifting away. Now at the very beginning, what they, the whole point of the strategic alignment process was to make things better, to get control over the organization. By the time you've gone through the reality of implementing things, the executives suddenly discover, ah, we haven't got the set level of control we thought we had, and in fact it's probably got worse, so let's go round about it again. And the result is going to be more drift. So that was the title of this book that Claudia Shibora, Ole Hanseth and a couple of other guys put together called From Control to Drift. The desire for more control, the fact that actually you don't get the control. And you really need, there's a set one or two copies of the book From Control to Drift actually in the library and it makes very, very interesting reading because the first four chapters are a little bit difficult, very theoretical. But the final eight or ten chapters are a set of amazingly interesting and very, very valuable case studies uh, about things that happened during the 1990s. And they are a very, very good set of case studies that help us to realize that this whole process is very, very difficult. So get hold of that book, guys. Read it. Um, and see how that actually affects your understanding of this whole business of providing IT to organizations. Now the second part, we look first of all at strategic IT alignment. Now we're looking at a question about value and we bump into another nasty. If we look at Embedded systems, machine control, uh, computer-aided design, uh, computer-aided manufacturing. We can see there are some areas where productivity has changed very, very dramatically. But what we haven't seen adequately is the impact of information technology, particularly in the office environment, making any changes. And various studies have shown a negative relationship between the amount of money spent on IT and the re any resulting changes to productivity. We've not seen significant increases in output, particularly 
in the white collar office environment, irrespective of how much money we pour in there. <clears throat> we cannot see any relationship between the amount of money spent in, and being invested in IT into, and any increases in profitability of organizations. If you look at big companies who've been reporting their profit and loss and spend on IT for the last 20 years, the big FTSE 100 type or FTSE 250 companies, the thousand companies in Britain over 500 employees. Now that they're spending two, three, four percent of revenue on IT, one might have expected to see some improvement in profitability, and we cannot detect that. One of the possible issues is that they're looking at quantitative, you know, pound notes spent versus pound notes uh, in terms of improved profitability. So we're emphasizing the tangible measures rather than what we call intangible, things like better quality, better service levels, lower levels of churn, i.e. the changing customer things, which might be one of the reasons why we can't detect something. However, let's have one or two, a look at one or two interesting uh, graphs or charts. Yes, it's quite an old chart of 1994. This shows the amount of money spent per employee on IT in companies in 1994, from $100 to $100,000 per employee. And the rate of return, this is one of the measures of a benefit to the organization. Yes, there's a sort of line that goes through there, the average line, which suggests they're kind of positive. But, you know, you've got, to get 0.2% return on uh, equity, you can either spend 100 quid, or you can spend 100,000 pounds, or 60,000 anyway there. Or if you spend $2,000 per head, you can get a return of negative to 0.5%. Are any of you, if this was your money, would you use that to justify any amount of spend? It's random. That cloud is a totally random cloud of data. It tells you nothing other than there is absolutely no connection between money spent and what you get back from it. A different one published a few years later. And this is essentially the same date, clap, a set of points as in the previous one, but plotted differently. And someone has sort of said, OK, I've got an Excel spreadsheet that has all of that plotted on it, and I'm going to press a little button that says do the um, correlation. And it comes up, as you might expect, with that line. It will come up with a line. What this doesn't give you is the correlation coefficients to see what confidence you can have in that. Now, what was even more bizarre, a little bit later on, <coughs> in fact, about five, six years after this, a consultancy provided a really lovely chart that had two blocks, one there and one there, and said, by the way, look at this. This is fantastic. If you increase your amount of spend on IT, Look at you, will go from there to there. And then I realized that that chart, those two vertical bars, were based on Brynjolfsson's chart here. So if you only saw those two vertical bars there and there, you might make a decision that says, oh, it's worthwhile doing. If you see the raw data, you will know that there is no relationship whatsoever between those two sets of data, the productivity improvements in this case and the amount of IT that you've invested, or amount you've invested in IT. That tells you there is no relationship whatsoever. So we are not getting a good answer to value. And then someone else put together this little chart that shows 
how much a company spends on its IT there <coughs> and how much they spend on sort of overheads in general. And as you'd expect, there they are relatively close linked. But again, remember, this is a, these are both log scales. So that's going 10, 10, 10. So from there to there is about 100 times that whole band, the spread, reflects a hundred times from the bottom person to top. It's always getting that. No relationship. Other than it's a broad trend that the bigger you are, because that really measures how big you are, um, it kind of vaguely relates to how much you can afford to spend on the other side. But huge variation in what we actually do with stuff. Other people during the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s have said, now, okay, well, this is processes. Because we're getting into the port of value chain and things like that, and it says these are the ways that we can use IT to make the businesses better. Yeah, we can improve individual business processes, perhaps. We can link different business processes together more effectively, perhaps. We can even connect with our outside organizations, our customers and our suppliers. So those were the claims. These are the things that in an ideal world can be delivered. But we do not live in ideal worlds. We live in a real world of people and broken and fractured and unreliable technology. Makes this a bit tricky. We can do more with our data. We can, now that we've got this a new concept um, that we're developing here in the university with the big data uh, laboratory, which is just being sort of floated now. Yeah, we can do lots of things with the data. And the conference I'm going to next week uh, in, uh, in the States, IBM are collecting together something like 14,000 people, IBM people sh set, sh showcasing the things they can do, and many, many customers showcasing what they have achieved. And they're doing, telling us about these sort of things, telling us about how they're achieving that here, and how they can improve all that communication. And there are, although there's quite a lot of people presenting next week, the reality is it's only a small proportion of businesses which are successful at this, even amongst the very biggest organizations. And we tend to see amongst the smaller organizations, the SMEs, small and middle-sized enterprises, they are not ever so effective at doing any of those things. We can use this, and if you think about Formula One, as a, which I use as a classic example, a problem, <coughs> say, a week ago, mechanical f failure can be fixed. New bits designed, tested electronically in the computers, simulations, manufactured and fitted to the cars um, by, where are we, Friday, yesterday, so they can actually have a good race tomorrow, uh, on Saturday, Sunday, uh, down in... Um, Austin. So we are seeing some amazing things going on. If you look at what's happening now with 3D printing, that's getting even more exciting as to how we can improve the production processes. And remember, production processes, the manufacturing processes are the area which have been spectacularly affected and improved by all of this IT. It doesn't significantly affect the administrative type systems. And again, now if you think about the f continuously falling price of your PCs, your um, microwaves, ovens, fridges, uh, and all of those other things where they've got embedded controllers, that has had a staggering effect in improving the performance, 
what they can capable of doing and bring the costs down enormously. Building IT in the form of robots and so on on production lines again has had an amazing effect in terms of quality and reliability. Just go down the road a little way down the A38 to Toyota <coughs> with all of their roboticized production lines. Stunning levels of quality. Amazing prices compared with 20, 30 years ago in comparative terms. So down here, huge benefits. All of that lot, manufacturing techniques, the hardware, the cars, the type of control systems we have are, make, are making turbo-controlled cars much easier to drive, at least for us. Not necessarily at the racing level because they still haven't have got issues there because they're trying to get that last little tiny bit. Or if you go back to the turbo um, engines in the 80s and the 90s for Formula One, they really were either on or off, whereas a beautiful graduation today. So mechanical control systems, production group systems, robots. Human administration systems are problems still. And we can see these sort of things happening quite regularly. And if you think about Capital One, big, what do you think of Capital One's main, who's heard of Capital One to start with? Cards. What do they do? The cards? Yeah, the credit cards. Yeah. However, when their chief executive or chief data officer back in the back end of the 1990s in a t uh, television interview was asked, what is your business about? <coughs> they were expecting, as part of the introduction to this interview, a statement, we're in the credit card business. Nope, we're not in the credit card business, we are in the information business. Because they, as a credit card processor, they know every single thing you spend your money on. And what they would, did, they set up a group in Nottingham, at their Capital One headquarters, in the UK headquarters in, in uh, Nottingham, a small group, who just analyzed that data <coughs> and then came up with new financial products targeted at small pockets of their customer base. And if you think about Tesco, um, loyalty card managed through Dunhumby, you think about your Nectar card, you think about the um, loyalty cards for almost any organization. They're using that to do that job. Yes, they give you, you know, a penny per, th per pound as a sort of cash back. But that's essentially a bribe for you to give them access to all of your purchasing pattern data. And if you then register that, your phone number, <coughs> to your Nectar card or your loyalty card, and in, well, and, oh, and then register this or use this to link into their free Wi-Fi that they have in the store. Why do they give you their Wi-Fi? Not so that you can use Wi-Fi and the internet while you're in store, but so they know who you are and when you come into their shop and which shop you go to. So if I, as I have unfortunately, um, got free access, register for free access with this device in Sainsbury's. If, wherever I go into a Sainsbury's shop now, they will know, ah, that, that phone from the MAC address or the IMI number or the MAC address will, will be adequate. I haven't yet connected that to my Nectar card, so it's not completely helpful to them. But they still see patterns. And that's valuable to them to do this. An amazingly valuable service to understand how their customers are moving around. We can look at market trends again with big data analytics, de anal um, predictive analytics, <coughs> uh, and all the various other pro analytics programs that are being developed. And there'll be lots of presentations next week out in um, Insight.
There will be lots of presentations next week, four or five hotels up the, the um, Strip in Las Vegas at the SAS Analytics Conference. And that will have sort of two days solid presenting of, this is the sort of thing that we're doing with analytics to help us support our customers better, help us to make better business decisions. And SAS at that conference will be telling their customer base, and here are yet more magical tools which will help you to gain more and more and more insights about what your customers are doing, and your suppliers and other partners. That's what they're trying to get at, market share. More people coming to them than go to competitors. That means more sales, more profit. Particularly if we can do all of this without having to give discounts and offers. If we can make our customers feel loved or better loved than our competitors do, we will get more market share. That's what um, waitroads do. That's why they hardly ever give any discounts. They don't need to. They're pushing quality. They're pushing, we love you guys. Feel that you are part of us rather than you know, value products, i.e. the cheapest we can manage for you at a reasonable quality. All sorts of ways of gaining insights. So what I want you to do um, for the first part is to build your working bibliography looking for copies of all sorts of interesting and useful sources. Uh, the next slide actually, is, or the next two slides, <coughs> are the bibliography for where I got all of this information from. You can still get at most of it. And this will help you to get a better idea about this idea of value from IT, alignment of IT with business, and so on and so forth. The other guy to look at is very careful, is to look at Strasman's website, and you'll see it in the, the link in the, in the bibliography. Strasman.com, two S's at MMA. Now he's really interesting. He's a guy who's worked with IT all his life, through the whole life of IT. He's a bit older than me, and he's seen things for long, uh, longer, longer than I have. And he really gets what IT can and what IT can't do. And he's not an evangelist for IT like so many people are. IT is brilliant. He is incredibly clear-eyed about what IT can and can't do. And his website contains every single article, every single interview, and so on that he's ever given. It's an amazing resource that will help you to understand how to gain value from information technology. So you've got lots and lots of links here, lots and lots of um, sources that you can go into EBSCO and Emerald and get copies of most of these. Now I'm going to lead on to, on to um, the other side, which is the other set of work that you need to be doing today. And I want you to look at the three or four topics. And for each one, I want you to spend a fair bit of time just researching and researching more and more um, sources. So you've got the three or four, two or three pages on the seminar section, which give you a, a large number of 1990s, early 2000s uh, sources. I want you now to bring that up to date to today. I want you to think about definition of value of IT. So think about what do we mean by the word value? What do we mean by IT? How does that relate? Think about, so go and find the three or four different definitions and then compare them. A critical evaluation of this definition against this definition and try to see what they're each trying to point you towards. See whether they are sensible definitions See how you can pull the best parts of each definition together into your own totality, a synthesis 
of that. Think about the strengths and weaknesses of the definitions. And although I want you to create your own synthesized definition, I want you also to explain why you've got there or how you've got there. It's not just, I've come up with this great. Okay. Why? Justify it. Another section is on researching into the question of how does IT provide value for organizations? Thinking about those two questions we started with. And then whether you look at the services that we provide here for you or the subject of the assignment, which is how can services be developed based around location services, that might be a more effective use of your time. Because that means you'll be starting to work into your assignment for the end of term. So either use that uh, topic or the assignment topic, whichever you feel like doing. And then for, well, not next week, but the week after, because as you know, I'm not here next week. Um, so you'll need to, you'll have to come in, want to come in here and work for yourselves. Look at the videos from last year around these topics and develop some ideas which you would possibly want to put into your assignment around the question of how can IT and location services add value to a service, to a business. Remember, you need citations and references. <coughs> and then, if you want me to, during the workshop in two weeks' time, I'll be able to come round and I'll be able to talk to you. If you want me to have a look at your what you've written, so I can make relevant, helpful comments and feed, give you feedback so that you can improve that section in your assignment. Uh, and we'll be doing that from now on. We'll be using the workshop period specifically for you to get feedback on the development of your assignment. So you should also be thinking about the precise topic that you are going to focus on in your article that you're writing for your assignment. And there you have it, folks. Uh, what we're wanting to do today, and then what you're going to do by yourselves next week, <coughs> and then what we're going to do when we come back, when I come back a in a fortnight's time. Or thereabout. No. Let's think. No, I'll be here next week. Sorry. So we can do this that exercise next week, and then the week after I won't be here. So you've got another week of me next week, and then the week after that, uh, early November, I shan't be here. Okay, folks. <coughs>